of RNA. So this is the G that's found in uh, ribonucleic acid. And after mixing these together, uh, we would use gel electrophoresis to separate the unspliced RNA from the splicing products. The way that this works is that you make uh, essentially a slab of a material that's very similar to jello and then place the, the solution containing the molecules at the top, apply a potential field difference, and, uh, and in the uh, presence of this electric field, the negatively charged ribonucleic acid is, uh, goes away from the negative pole towards the positive pole, and as it goes down, uh, small, small molecules are able to move much more quickly uh, as they're sieved by the gel matrix than the large molecules. Well, the first time that we did this experiment, it worked, which is unusual in molecular biology or any kind of science, that when we mix these molecules together in the presence of the nuclear extract, we were able to see the excised intron uh, being, re being released, and so that was uh, uh, very exciting. But rather perplexing was the fact that in a control experiment in which one of the components of the um, splicing reaction had been left out, namely the nuclear extract had not been added, we saw just as much splicing taking place. Well, that was uh, a very unexpected result, our first thought was that we had somehow uh, mixed up the test tubes and uh, needed to repeat the experiment, which we did a number of times and found that very reproducibly, simply mixing the unspliced RNA together with these small molecules was sufficient for splicing to take place. So where is the catalyst in this system? Well, as the director of this uh, at the time, very young laboratory, it was up to me to come up with a hypothesis that would explain the results. If you're taking notes, which I see many of you are, you might want to not take notes on this particular slide because this hypothesis turns out to be completely wrong. But that's not bad in science. As long as a hypothesis f follows naturally from what you know at the time, as long as it can explain the phenomenon and is consistent with you know, the laws of chemistry and physics, doesn't uh, seem like it's an impossibility, and especially important, as long as it's testable, then one can make a great deal of progress. You test the hypothesis. If it turns out to pass the test, then you retain the hypothesis, perhaps subjecting it to even more rigorous testing. If it fails the hypothesis, you've still, if it fails the test, you've still learned something, and you can either discard or appropriately revise the hypothesis, and in that uh, rather zigzag pathway, make progress understanding a system. So the idea here was maybe the RNA, shown as the solid line, that we were extracting from the tetrahymena cells wasn't really pure RNA. Maybe a protein splicing enzyme shown here as the faint dashed line, you can see I wasn't too sure of the hypothesis, maybe that was coming along for the ride when we isolated the RNA from tetrahymena. So then when we mixed this molecule together with the uh, guanosine and the, the magnesium ion, a reaction which had been initiated really inside the cell was simply uh, playing itself out in the test tube. So maybe there was a protein enzyme involved as we had originally supposed. Well, how do you test this sort of hypothesis? Well, biochemists know lots of uh, good ways to inactivate proteins. And so we applied some of these. For example, proteins, un their chains unravel in the presence of detergent. That's why you add detergent when you wash your clothes to remove prote proteinaceous stains. And so we added detergent to this uh, RNA, and lo and behold, when we added the guanosine and the magnesium, the splicing continued. Well, that's very unusual for a protein. Well, then we decided to boil the RNA. So high temperature, again, is denaturing for protein chains. Again, you use often high temperature when you're washing clothes. And we boiled the solution, and when we reduced the temperature back to room temperature, added the small molecules, splicing again continued unabated. 
Again, a seemingly unusual property for a protein. Well, we now thought maybe this has to, now you revise the hypothesis a little bit. Perhaps this is a very unusual protein that's resistant to both boiling and detergent. Maybe we'll, we'll add detergent and boil in the presence of detergent. We did that, and it had no effect on the reaction. At that point, we bought uh, large quantities of very nonspecific proteases, which are enzymes that hydrolyze or degrade other protein molecules, and added these uh, enzymes, which are also present in enzyme-activated laundry detergents. You can see there's a theme here. It's just like doing laundry. Um, when we added these proteases to our starting material, again, it had no effect on splicing. So now the hypothesis that there was a uh, splicing enzyme pre-associated with the RNA was not looking very good. And this brings us to uh, the Christmas of 1981 when Paula Grabowski, one of my graduate students, gave me uh, this as a Christmas gift. I don't know if you can see it from where you are. So, uh, fortunately, we were able to think of something a little more scientific than picking the petals off the daisy to resolve the question of whether there was a protein there or not. But we had to have some positive evidence. We knew that if we simply had negative evidence that the, uh, that the activity was resistant to a series of treatments that normally destroy protein, that this would provide a weak argument. And so we wanted to make the RNA in some way artificially so that it had never seen the inside of a tetrahymena cell and test that RNA to see if uh, it could still undergo this uh, rearrangement, this RNA splicing, cutting and pasting reaction. So the question is, if we make RNA in a very artificial way, will it still undergo this self-splicing? To do this, we turned to what at the time was a fairly new field of genetic engineering or recombinant DNA manipulations. We took a portion of the gene that encoded uh, both the intron and some of the flanking coding sequences or exons of the DNA, uh, took that fragment and put it in a circular uh, piece of bacterial DNA called a plasmid, so that when this is reintroduced into the bacterium E. coli, it is replicated along with the bacterial chromosome, and one can get a large amount of a very uh, defined circular piece of DNA to be produced. We then extracted the DNA from the bacterium and added purified RNA polymerase, this enzyme which copies DNA into RNA, to transcribe now this artificial shortened version that contained a part of the exons and the entire intron. We then removed the one protein that had been adding the well-characterized RNA polymerase and added the uh, magnesium ion and the GTP under conditions where splicing had pre we had previously found the splicing to take place. And that RNA chain was now cut apart and the two distant sites ligated or uh, bonded together and the intron removed at exactly the same sites where the splicing took place in the living cell. And that was important because this, at this point, this was a very artificial test tube reaction, and we needed some assurance that this, was, this process was relevant to biology and the fact that the specificity of site selection had been retained gave us that confidence. So at this point, it seemed that the RNA by itself, this RNA, and for all we knew, perhaps other RNAs, would, had the ability to form an active site and speed up, catalyze, without the active site itself being changed, a very, specific, a very specific biochemical reaction. In other words, looked like RNA could be a catalyst. Perhaps RNA could be an enzyme. And to us, that was a very exciting um, finding in basic cell or molecular